fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. You are back in the House of Mystery on KFNX Phoenix. Uh, thank you for coming back and seeing us. Now, uh, today we're continuing with more true crime. And uh, we have uh, an author with us named Monty Francis, and uh, I caught on to his latest book, Ice and Bone, and it's The Tracking of an Alaskan Serial Killer. So uh, just in the title, it sounds kind of exciting to me. Um, so thank you for taking time to talk to us, Monty. Sure. Thanks for having me. So this is fascinating. Um, now, this wasn't your first book either, was it? This is your second true crime book. Yeah, I wrote a book in 2007 that was published by HarperCollins called By Their Father's Hand. It was a true story about a man in Fresno, California, who was convicted of murdering nine of his his children. It was pretty a, a terrible story that I'd covered as a TV reporter in Fresno and um, ended up writing a book about it. That must have been pretty hard, like because uh, if you're covering a story as a reporter um and it it kind of um you follow it it attracts you into writing a book um it must have been a hard sort of process to deal with because it doesn't it consume you all the time um yeah it did and I, you know and i covered not only was i there for the uh, actual crime itself like i was there the night that um there was a domestic disturbance, and essentially what had happened in, in that story was that um, the family had this murder-suicide pact that if the government ever came to you know, separate the family, that the older kids would kill the younger ones and, and then themselves. And so they all sort of talked to the kids from the time they were you know, very little. And there was incest in the family and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, I was at the crime scene as they, you know, were announcing to us, you know, the death count was going up, you know, five people dead, seven people dead, nine people dead, and then they escorted the father out, you know, this um, overweight guy with very long dreadlocks, and he was covered in blood, you know, and he was the father of this family, and it was pretty horrific, so, and I can remember doing live shots that night, and one of the other reporters I was with broke down in tears in the middle of her live shot, because it was so overwhelming, you know. Um, and then I covered that trial, which went on for, I, if I recall, it was like a three-month trial, and I was blogging about it from inside the courtroom, but we got, I got permission from the judge to sort of blog the testimony, and people started following the blog, and that's kind of how I fell into writing a book about it. But interesting, you said, like, you know, how do you deal with these things when you're writing about that? Um, the the entire time I was covering that story, really from beginning to end, even the the trial itself, I really didn't have, and it, and it was a very disturbing story. I mean, very disturbing because you had incest and murder, and he was playing all kinds of psychological games with his children and stuff. It, it didn't bother me while I was I was covering it, but then after it was done, like I finished the book and sort of put everything aside, that's when I started, I started having nightmares about it. It was something, I think when you do something psychologically as a reporter when you're covering something, you're able to like put up a wall in a way to sort of keep yourself separated from it so that you can be objective in reporting it. But you're also a human being, so at some point that stuff starts to seep through, you know, and, and it starts to affect you in that way. Yeah, yeah, I, I can imagine. I, I, because I know I get that way on some of the stories I cover, and um, so your background was in um, reporting, right? Yeah, and actually, I still report um, on television. I work for a 
television station here in the Bay Area, KTVU, the Fox affiliate. And I was with the NBC affiliate before that. So primarily I was, and still report on television, and then I write true crime. I shouldn't say on the side, because this last book took me, I basically took a year off and, and researched and wrote um, Ice and Bone. So I, I do both, write and report on television. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what made you start writing the book? Like when you went to the very first book even, was there something that um, made you want to write a book on true, true crime itself? That, well, honestly, the, the way that happened was, um, and it, I, I'm told it never happens this way, but um, an agent approached me out of the blue. I guess they found out that I had written this blog that had become popular and asked if I would be interested in writing a book. And I hadn't even really considered it. And I had just finished my, completed my MFA in creative writing at Fresno State time. And I was working at the TV station and I decided that I would, that I would give it a try, that I would do it. And, um, I started trying to write after, you know, I would work, you know, an eight hour day, come home and then try to write afterwards. And I quickly figured out, because the publisher had a deadline that I was not going to meet the deadline. So I essentially, you know, took the advance money. I quit my job as a TV reporter, moved to the Bay Area, and just started. And then for the next couple of months, finished that first book. I wrote it within, I think, three months or something. Um, and that was kind of it. And I, I, so the first book, I just sort of fell into it, you know, as they say. And then I really did enjoy the, the experience of, of writing the book because, you know, you're able to delve into something in, in a much deeper way. And then, um, so that was seven, let's see, that was 2007. So then last year, and I'd been wanting to write another book. I actually had written a proposal for one. Um, it's a long story. <laughs> that whole thing fell through. So I became discouraged about writing another book for a while. And finally, I sort of gained up the courage and desire to write another book and when I found this story in Alaska. Now, the new book, Ice and Bone, that's tracking of an Alaskan serial killer. Um, so you said you found that. How did you find that case? Well, I was looking for another case to write about, and I knew that I wanted to do something with unsolved crimes. And... I was also intrigued by Alaska. I'd never been there. I liked the idea of a story being set in such a desolate place. And so I was just sort of searching around in the archives, you know, and came across this article in the Anchorage Daily News from 2000 that um, about the murders of six women who had all been killed within a relatively short time span like well I think it was 16 months and five of them were native or were Alaska natives and one was African American and at the time they thought that the serial killer was on the loose so I began by looking at you know this was 2014 when I was looking at the article I began by looking at what which of these cases had been solved you know all these years later and I found out that three of them had been you know sort of resolved and then three were still unsolved and the thing that intrigued me was one of the cases um, was a woman by the name of Della Brown who was found beat to death in a shed. And the killer in that case, or the person who had been, you know, tried for her murder, was acquitted and had walked free. And then he went out and murdered a, another woman, totally separate from the first six. There was a trial in the Della Brown case, but... In the second case, Mindy Schloss, the woman that he murdered, as a result of a plea deal in that case, he admitted that he had indeed killed Bella Brown, even though he had been acquitted. And there was some suspicion as to whether or not he had killed these other women as well. So I found that to be intriguing because these cases were still unresolved so many years later. And I called a woman by the name of Disa Jacobson. She was quoted in the newspaper article. She's a native um, an Alaska Native activist, and she had gone on a hunger strike because she was so upset about the verdict in the Della Brown case, and she felt there was 
not enough attention being paid to these unsolved cases involving Native women. And so I began talking to her, and she was really the one who ended up convincing me that this was a story worth telling. I mean, she she's a very compelling personality. So in general, what happened in the case, the, the basic points? Well, so as I said, there were these, there were these six women who had been murdered. Della Brown was one of them. Um, there was this big trial because... Joshua Wade, who was this young, you know, twenty year old drug dealer, had basically confessed to his friend that he had killed her. He was kind of bragging. In fact, he brought some of them one by one to the shed to show show them her body. And um some of them ended up calling crime stoppers, you know, to collect the money, the reward money. And all of that sort of led them, led police to um, wire some of his friends. I go, these are recorded, secretly recorded police wire. And, uh, and what they did was they took the newspaper article, that front page article, uh, the same one that I had come across that, that recounted the murder of these six women that had pictures of all of them on the front page of the local paper. And they planted this newspaper on the dashboard of the car. This is also a car the police had given to these these two informants, we'll call them. And so when Joshua Wade gets into the car, he sees the newspaper article. And the idea was this would spark some kind of conversation, you know, during which he would make some kind of confession. What ends up happening is he makes a comment, and, I'm, and he's profane, so I won't say exactly what he said, but he basically indicates there are three women on here that I killed. And um, the one of the informants says to him, you know, hey, what's up with you and Native women? And he says, well, not all of them are Native. She was black, referring to the only victim in the case who was black. So... From that, it appears that he made a suspensible admission that he had killed three of the women. And um, But the thing was, is that during the Della Brown case, the jury, they weren't allowed to hear evidence that indicated that he had killed anyone else besides that victim, so all that stuff was kind of edited out of the tape. So that was sort of the, the premise that I started the book with, because I was, I was interested in finding out, did he indeed kill these other women, why was why did it seem that attention was not being paid to these other cases? Was Deesa Jacobson right that law enforcement uh, wasn't paying attention to these cases because they were native elected women? You know, all of that I found intriguing and I, I wanted to find out more. So that's why I that's why I decided to go to Alaska. I spent a month there kind of researching the case before I embarked on actual the actual writing of the book. So that's really interesting. Um, you know, we covered a lot of the uh, Highway of Tears murders, uh, mm -hmm. which you probably heard about up in northern BC, about mm -hmm. uh, Alaskan, or not Alaskan, but Native girls being, uh, you know, killed and gone missing, and uh, the lack of, um, let's say, uh, support from the police. Do you think that's the true case here as well, or? Well, I mean, the thing I was just thinking about was, you know, you know, and Deesa Jacobson said this to me too. I mean, pred the predators are aware that in, that law enforcement um, doesn't follow up on these cases, and and if you just look at like the instance of rape among Alaska Native women, it's it's staggering. I mean, the statistics show it's like twelve times the national average in some of these villages, and many of these. And, you know, when you're not in a large city like Juneau or Anchorage, um, many of those villages don't have road access, so it's, like, impossible to even get there in the wintertime unless you're on a helicopter. Many of them don't have law enforcement. There's no way that these women can report sexual assault if it has indeed happened to them. So the ones that are reported are the ones that show up in the statistics. In the statistics. And so you have to assume that it's even worse than what the numbers Say it is, and I heard someone say, and this is totally, you know, anecdotal, but that, you know, by a certain age, by you know, preteen age, all Alaska Native women have been raped, 
Now, that's not been proven, but that's something that is said, you know, in, in the community. Um, so if you just take that that part and, you know, that issue of rape and um, how, it, how it's um, regarded, you can sort of extrapolate. Yeah, predators see that that's a reality and that they could take advantage of it in various ways. And do you think that it's also a lack of policing itself? Is there just not enough police officers up there? Well, like as I said, like a lot of those villages don't have law enforcement. So there's not even really a way for people to report those cases. I mean, I guess you'd have to conceivably come to a city where you could talk to a police officer, you know. But, you know, like, for example, the village where Della Brown was from is called Shishmaref. It's, like, way up at the Bering Strait. In fact, it's, it's you may have, I don't know if you've seen this on the Internet, but it's this village that's because of global warming is, and erosion is kind of falling into the sea. So you'll see pictures of huts kind of dangling off cliffs, you know, falling into the water. And they've had to move people. Anyway, but it's a very, very remote. I mean... So the idea that someone who is a victim of a crime could just walk down to the police station and report it, it just doesn't happen that way. Yeah. Yeah, it's really too bad. Um, so you actually lived there a month. How did you find people to respond to you? Because you're there writing a book about this. Were they pretty supportive and open to you? Yeah, I mean, they were. I mean, the thing that, the thing that I didn't realize before I went, this was just my own, you know, naivete. I, I went in November, which was, Ooh. You know, I, I guess it didn't register to me that, like, that's the <laughs> darkest time of year. So I got there, and there it was, like, dark the entire time. I think the sun came up for, like, an hour or something and then <laughs> went back down. So after, like, three weeks there, I was starting to feel a little bit, like, crazy. Like, wait, why is the sun not coming up? And I see why people, you know, they I, I just I connected with a friend of mine, a, a mutual friend there, who has kids, and they would sit at the breakfast table with those you know, mood lights on, yeah. they, it's seasonal affective disorder is a big thing there. But yeah, so that was one thing that I didn't really think about before I went. But yeah, people were very um, open and and friendly. I talked to a lot of the victims' um, family and friends. Stella Brown's mother was very open and talked to me. I talked to uh, like most of her siblings. Um, the one thing I found to be a big challenge in doing research, because the trial, the Della Brown's trial lasted for so long. It was like three months long. They don't, in the court system there, they don't have a court reporter in the courtroom that's like, you know, typing everything out. So they have an audio recording of what happened. And so the way you have to get a hold of, of transcripts, well, they're not really transcripts. You have to get a hold of the audio. They have these things called log notes, and then you have to order the, the different portions you want. And then I, myself, had to go through, listen to the tapes, and then transcribe them. It took me probably two months, <laughs> huh. you know, after I left Alaska, just to do that part of it. It was, it was pretty tedious. Wow. Yeah, that would be crazy. Crazy. Mm -hmm. What's the overall impression up there? How do they, how do they feel about uh, uh, this crime and other crimes toward uh, Alaskan Native women? Is this sort of, do they look at it as a race issue? I mean, you know, it depends on who you talk to, of course. I mean, Tisa Jacobson, um, we became very, uh, you know, we became friends. And, and when I was up there, we spent some time together. She took me down to, um, there's a place in Anchorage. It's sort of near the port of Anchorage, but it's um, where a lot of the homeless people camp out. And like, keep in mind, this is Alaska in wintertime. It's like 18 degrees outside. People are like camped out in tents. You know, they built fires and stuff. And she, I had a rental car, and we drove down there, and she was pointing out to me all the homeless people, and she all of a sudden became very, like, agitated at the thing. Look at, these are the landowners. They're the landowners. And she was sort of exclaiming, that, sort of jumping up and down. And I didn't understand immediately what she meant, but then it, re it dawned on me, oh, she's referring to the fact that almost all of these homeless people are native. Native people, and it enraged her to think like that these were the native people of the land, and here they were relegated to living out on the streets, and she found it very upsetting. I mean, as I said, it really depends on who you talk to as to 
whether they think there's a, you know, a big injustice against Native people. I mean, you can't, but when you look at the statistics and, and what's happening in the Native community, it's, it's troubling. I mean, even if you look at the instance of, like, fetal alcohol syndrome, I mean, it's really, I mean, they've done something to correct, I think, that problem. But, you know, fetal alcohol syndrome, just so people don't know, it's what, it's a condition that results after a woman drinks during pregnancy, and it can result in a number of developmental problems for for that person. And the cycle continues because then that child is more likely to uh, be in, be involved in crime and have problems and delinquency. And anyway, the, so the cycle, it's like a vicious cycle. But, um, and at one point, it's not this way now, but at one point it was like 40% of the babies born in the Native community were at risk of having this syndrome. And I think that the state health officials have done a lot to correct it. But as I said, like it, it is a cycle because a whole generation of people were affected by that. Yeah, yeah, it's going to take some time. Um, how were the police toward you? Um, honestly, <laughs> the police the police were not cooperative. The Anchorage police were not cooperative at all. I I called them multiple times while I was there. Spoke to their public information officer. Finally, I got the head of the homicide unit to agree to meet with me. And I had this huge long list of questions that we had all these questions about the unsolved cases. And um, he was very polite and he was nice, but he basically didn't tell me anything. He refused to answer any questions about it. Even like in one of the cases, it was unclear how the woman had been killed and he wouldn't even tell me that. I mean, these are cases that were, you know, 14 years old and had been cold. So, but the FBI who became very much involved with, the case um, after Mindy Schloss was murdered, um, and the federal prosecutors as well, um, were very cooperative and great. And um, and I should also say that the lead detective in the, the Mindy Schloss case for the police, Pam Pernu, was was very helpful to me. I want to point that out. She no longer works for the police department. She in fact works for the FBI. <laughs> she lives in D.C. and I interviewed her in D.C. But um, she was she was great. She was absolutely great. Um, but yeah, it was a challenge. It was a challenge trying to get information out of the police, and I, I still don't really know why that was. I did talk to you know one of the investigators in the Della Brown case, and he he did not want to talk to me. I'm not. I'm still not clear as to why, because he had said something about not wanting to offend the family, and I explained to him, well, I've interviewed the family, and they're they've, you know, given their blessings of what I'm, what I'm doing. And he still wouldn't talk to me. So I don't know what, I don't know what that was all about. Yeah. Kind of defensive. Hmm. So now what eventually happened to the killer? Like, did he actually get convicted in the end? Yes, he did. He, um, there was a plea deal in the Mindy Schloss case and he admitted, um, that he had killed Mindy Schloss, so he was convicted of first-degree murder in that case and accepted a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. He also, at that sentencing, admitted that he had killed Della Brown. And then um, and he apologized and made this emotional statement, and then the judge started to kind of um, deliver his thoughts about the case, and he and, and Joshua Wade all of a sudden, from this mood of being, you know, appearingly remorseful, got very angry, which is very characteristic of him. He would he had this very explosive temper, and um, the judge called him a coward, and that really made him mad. So he he um, and he didn't like the perception that he was um, only victimizing women. So he so he blurted out at the sentencing to, to the judge. What about all the men I killed? And the judge said, well, I don't know anything about the men you've killed. What are you talking about? And he said, well, don't make it seem like I've just killed women. I killed men, too, or something like that. And, but that's what he left. That's kind of where he left it. And then many months later, when he was very upset that he, that he was being kept in 
the prison system in Alaska because obviously he was well known, he was notorious, and and the native people who were in jail with him or in prison with him um, obviously didn't like the fact that he had victimized this native woman. So he wanted to get out of Alaska. And so he admitted to these three additional murders. These were apparently the men to whom he was referring at the sentencing. And in exchange for admitting to those three additional murders, they uh, moved him out of Alaska to a federal prison, well, initially in Indiana, and then they moved to Pennsylvania, and he's now at a federal prison at Beaumont, Texas. Did he have an actual M.O.? to this? Like, was there a certain type of woman or man or certain way of killing? Um, uh, was there something that that he was looking for in the kill, or was it just for the fact of killing? It's really difficult to say. I mean, so the first killing that he admitted to, he was only 14 years old, and the guy who he killed was... He wasn't homeless, because I think he lived at a like a halfway house or something like that. But he was a very harmless, defenseless guy, you know, who was just walking down the street. And um, I talked to, I interviewed Joshua Wade's sister, and she told me that he, that he had talked, her brother had told her a little bit about the circumstances surrounding this, various mur- or this murder. And Wade said that the guy was trying to help him, actually, that he was, I don't know, trying to help him, um, get something to eat or something like that, and that Joshua Wade was kind of creeped out by him, and so he decided to shoot him in the back of the head. So, you know, that that was when he was 14 years old, if you can imagine. I mean, he was a very troubled kid. He had tried to commit suicide, you know, as a adolescent and was, in, was institutionalized, you know, was a delinquent and had, had run into with the law at a young age. You know, it's hard to say if he had a certain kind of of victim. So Joshua Wade's father, who I interviewed, seemed to think that his son has a fixation on, like, maternal figures. Because Bubba Wade, who is his father, told me that he thought that the victims all kind of looked similar and that they also sort of looked like Joshua Wade's mother. It looks like his mother. I've looked at all the pictures. I'm not sure if that's actually true. I mean, I guess you could say that there are, like, basic characteristics that they all share, but to me, they didn't really look all that similar. So it's, I think it's really difficult to say. I mean, Bubba Wade said his son just had an anger problem and that that probably explained the murders of the men. And as for the women... He thought it was like a fixation on maternal figures. I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, it's, it's, usually they have some sort of a, you know, something. You know, it's always the same kind of looking girl or man, and around the same right. age, and they do the same sort of thing, like stabbing or shooting or, uh, or whatever. I was just wondering if he had some sort of pattern. I guess you'd want to call it the best, um, but um, how how was the family about the the ending? Um, the different families that you had talked to, were they feeling that justice was served on this? Um, you're talking about, like, any of the families, you mean? Yeah, any of the ones that you actually got to talk to yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I talked to many of them. So, I mean, obviously, Della Brown's family felt like justice was not served in the first trial because he obviously was acquitted and, and sort of got away with it and then didn't admit to it till much later. Um, and, you know, Mindy Schloss wouldn't have been murdered had he been convicted during that first trial. So, and I dedicate a whole section of the book to sort of what went wrong in the trial. That's like a whole other, other story. But, um, yeah, I think that Mindy Schloss's friends, because she had some very, she didn't have really close familial ties, but had very close friends. She was a, a nurse psychologist, and um, some of like her best friend who I interviewed. Um, I think she was grateful that they didn't have to go through this long trial because it's very traumatic to go through a trial. I mean, you even um, 
Bella Brown's mother. I mean, you have to endure, like, all the crime scene photos being shown and all this graphic testimony, and you have to, like, relive relive it, you know, over and over again. So I think they were grateful they didn't have to go through a trial. I mean, some of these unsolved cases, so there's the, I mentioned the African-American woman who was killed. I interviewed her, um, her husband, and then her daughter, her daughter was only 14 at the time her mother was killed. And um, this had a really profound effect on her. And, like, all these years later, she still doesn't know, like, what happened. But she actually wrote to Joshua Wade in prison and asked him if he had anything to do with it. Because she felt like, well, what do I have to lose? He's spending the rest of the life in prison. And he, you know, he didn't, he didn't respond, which is, to me, not a surprise. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, how did this all leave you um, after going through this, going down to Alaska, spending your time there, um, flying all over, interviewing, doing all the um, transcribing of the, of the audio? Um, at the very end of it, and the book's finished and done, how has it changed you? Wow, that's a good question. Um well, I think I'm a lot more aware about what's happening up in Alaska. I mean, I, you know, it's something I'd never even been to Alaska before I embarked on this journey or this project. And um, it's a different world up there, you know. It's like uh, culturally, I mean, it, there's a, there are ways in which it's very American, but then there are ways in which it's foreign as well to me. I mean, to me, it's somebody who grew up in the Midwest and who's lived in California for the last 10 years. Um, and I think I wasn't aware also, it was sort of an education for me too about sort of the history of discrimination against Native Alaskans and sort of what the situation is there now. And so I think that that changed me. And, you know, anytime, and then also just, and I've written other stories that where you have to interview victims' families and, I'm always just amazed how resilient people can be who've experienced like the most horrible tragedies, you know, who've survived sort of the unthinkable. And that always sort of gives me, gives me hope kind of in a human spirit, you know, that you can survive something so horrible and find a reason to move on because it seems like sometimes that's not always possible. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So, who are your biggest influences um, on your writing itself? Um, well, you know, I have uh, my MFA. Um, I have a Master of Fine Arts and Creative Writing from Fresno State, and my MFA is actually in poetry. So, um, you know, Philip Levine was a big influence. He was involved in the uh, program at Fresno State. Connie Hales, who's a poet, who was very influential for me. Mary Carr, who has written a number of memoirs um, was at Syracuse University and taught the first writing workshop that I ever took. I, she was very influential. And when you talk about sort of like creative nonfiction and, and true crime, um, John Krakauer I think is amazing. I'm, I just read Missoula, he, uh, which recounts sort of the rape scandal there. I think he's, he's incredible. Um, and then of course, at Wild Blue Press, we have a number of really great um, true crime writers. Steve Jackson, who founded Wild Blue Press, and John Farrick, and a bunch of others um, are all doing really great work. One one really great book I listened to, I was driving across country recently, I listened to the audio book of The Looming Tower uh, by Lawrence Wright. It won the Pulitzer Prize. It sort of goes, it recounts sort of the road to 9-11, how we got there. I found that to be an amazing and important book, I thought. I mean, in terms of, like, creative nonfiction, to me, that's just, you can't get any better than that. So where do you see yourself going now? Like, what's next? Well, um, I can I continue to report here in the Bay Area. I, as I said, I work for a TV station here. And um, I haven't really thought about what my next, like, true crime project might be, but I... I plan to write another book. It's just it'll depend upon like the story and if I feel like there's enough there for a book. You know, sometimes you come across a 
a story and it's and you think, oh, that would be a good like short story, not a short story, but you know, like a good article. And then, but I think it's rare when you come across a case where you're like, oh, this this could be a book, you know. And so I think it's just a matter of finding that that next case or that next story. Yeah, you'll know when you see it. Kind of, it'll have the right feel, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's pretty amazing. So, how do people get a hold of you, and how would they contact you? What's your information? Oh well, you can go. I have a website, and it's just my name, Monte Francis M O N T E F R A N C I S dot com, and there are links there to all my social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter, and all that stuff. On Twitter, I'm at Monte Report with an S on the end of it. Um, yeah, that's how you can find me. Well, fantastic. Well, I want to thank you for taking this time and talking about your new book and uh, just about you. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.